Welcome to PALS, it's Prof. Sanyamu's anatomy lecture series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you are just joining us or you have not subscribed, we would like you to please do it now and be part of this amazing anatomy family. This is a lecture series on the embryology of the heart. The lecture is divided into five parts. Part 1, which you are watching now, is on the formation of the primary heart tube. Part 2 is on the development of atrium or the atrial chambers. Part 3 is the development of the ventricles and the outflow tract. Part 4 is on the clinical correlates of heart embryology. In part 5, we will test our knowledge of what we have learned in all the parts through our question and answer section where we will answer related questions from various examination boards. So let's go to class. The first system to start functioning in the embryo is the cardiovascular system. And the first organ of the body to start functioning is the heart. The process of heart formation starts from the middle of the third week at the 19 of intrauterine life. This is because diffusion alone will no more meet up with the nutritional requirements and waste disposal needs of the embryo. The heart begins beating as early as day 22 and starts pumping blood by the 24th to the 25th day. Its process of development will continue even while it is pumping blood. Now we we'll look at the formation of the cardiogenic cells. Development of heart begins with formation of cardiac primordium cells, also called cardiac progenitor cells. These cells emanate from cells around the primitive streak. Here is the embryo at the onset of gastrulation. This is its dosal surface, relating with the amniotic cavity. And here is the ventral surface, relating with the yolk sac. Let's have a closer view. Here is the primitive streak. Cranially here is the procodal plate. If we zoom in further, we isolate the two layers of the bilamellar jam disc, the epiblast here, and then the hypoblast. Progenitor heart cells, or the heart-forming cells, in the region immediately adjacent to the cranial end of the primitive streak here, will live through the primitive streak to migrate bilaterally and then cranially to become localized on either side of this primitive streak here. These cardiac progenitor cells will eventually become localized within the cranial lateral plate mesoderm on both sides of the embryo, forming an arch that is above the developing head region here. This arch is called the cardiac crescent or angiogenic cell cluster or cardiogenic area. Cells in the cardiac crescent will constitute what is called first heart field. That is here. Medial to the first heart field is another layer of cardiogenic cells from the splanchnic mesoderm, also called second heart field cells. The cells of the heart field are then induced by the underlying endoderm to form cardiac myoblasts and blood islands that will form blood cells and vessels by the process called vasculogenesis. These are the blood islands. The individual blood islands will later come together to form a horseshoe-shaped endothelial-lined tube surrounded by myoblasts. In addition to the cardiogenic region, other blood islands appear bilaterally, parallel and close to the midline of the embryonic shield. These islands form a pair of longitudinal vessels called the dosal aorta. Now we'll look at the pericardial cavity and septum transversum. This is the intraembryonic cavity. Above this cardiogenic region and procoda plate is the part of intraembryonic cavity that will later form the pericardial cavity. 
seen here. Above it also is another part of intraembryonic cavity that will give rise to the septum transversum. Septum transversum will form the central tendon of the diaphragm. Now we we'll consider formation of the heart tubes and also their fusion. The mesenchymal cells in the cardiogenic area will condense to form two angioplastic cords called cardiogenic cords. And this is also through the process of vasculogenesis. These cords will get canalized to form the two endothelial heart tubes. In this image, we can see the developing neural tube at the state of the neural groove. By the side is the paraxial mesoderm. Here is the somatopleuric mesoderm, and that is the splanchnopleuric mesoderm. Between them here is the intraembryonic cavity, and within the splanchnopleuric mesoderm are the cardiogenic cells that will give rise to the endothelial heart tubes. In this image, we see the two endocardial tubes already formed, but at different sides. The two tubes will come together following the lateral folding of the embryonic disc. Here, the two tubes are already lying together, surrounded by the pericardial cavity and lying anterior to the foregut. This image shows the longitudinal section. Here are the heart tubes, and here the fusion has taken place. The fusion of these tubes is in a craniocaudal direction. It starts from above and runs downwards. This single endocardial tube formed by the fusion of the two tubes is called the primitive or primary heart tube, which is the future heart. Failure of fusion of the two heart tubes will result to defective development of two independent hearts called cardia bifida. We will give more details in the section on the clinical correlates. Normally, the caudal ends of the two heart tubes will not fuse with each other, resulting in the inferior end of the heart being bifurcated, as we can note here. We will now take a look at the dilatations of the primary heart tube that has been formed. The single heart tube will now develop many constrictions and form five dilatations. So running from superiorly to inferiorly, we will first have the first dilatation, the truncus arteriosus, followed by bulbus cordis, then primitive ventricle, then primitive atrium, and finally the sinus venosus. In these five dilatations, the truncus arteriosus will form the arterial end of the primitive heart tube, while the sinus venosus will form the venous end of this tube. Let's consider the arterial end. This is truncus arteriosus. It continues superiorly with a part called the aortic sac. From this point is the aortic sac. The aortic sac has two horns, which are right and left dorsal horns. From each horn of aortic sac, the first pharyngeal arch artery arises, as we can see in this image. These arteries will pass backwards on the lateral side of the foregut to become continuous with the respective dorsal aorta here. Now let's look at the venous end. Sinus venosus consists of three parts, the central part here and right and left horns. Let's have a closer view. The central part communicates with primitive atrium and the two horns, right and left horns. The two right and left horns represent the unfused 
lower part of the two heart tubes. Each horn of sinus venosus receives three primitive veins, and they are the vitelline vein from the yolk sac, the umbilical vein from the placenta, and the common cardinal vein. We will consider next the fate of the various dilatations of the heart tube. We will start with right horn and body of sinus venosus. This part will be absorbed into the primitive atrium to form the smooth part of the right atrium. Now the left horn of sinus venosus will form part of the coronary sinus that opens into the smooth part of the right atrium. For the primitive atrium, it will get partitioned to form the rough part of both right and left atria. More details on the fate of specific components of the primitive heart will come in the course of this lecture. We will consider some of the processes that will give rise to the definitive heart shape that we see in the fully developed heart. The craniocaudal folding of the embryo and also the lateral folding of the embryo all have their different effects on the developing heart and the surrounding structures. So in this section, we are going to observe some of the features of the heart before the folding and then after the folding. This is the image of the embryo before the head fold. This is the cranial part and here is the caudal part. Here is the developing nervous system in form of the neural plate and anteriorly is the notochord. Number one important feature to observe here is the heart tube lying on the floor of the pericardial cavity. Number two feature is the pericardial cavity and the heart tube lying inferior to the septum transversum here. And then number three is the pericardial cavity and heart tube seen lying superior to the developing foregut. This is the developing foregut. In the course of the head formation, the cranial part of the embryo moves anteriorly and inferiorly, giving rise to these changes in the features. So these are the features after the head fold. Number one, the pericardial cavity and heart tube now come to lie ventral to the foregut. Number two, they have also come to lie cranial to the septum transversum. Number three, the heart tube is no longer at the floor of the pericardial cavity, but at the roof of the pericardial cavity. We will next consider formation of the cardiac wall. The cardiac wall is made up of three layers. From inside to outside, we will have the endocardium, the myocardium, and epicardium. These layers will develop as follows. Here is the heart tube. And this is the pericardial cavity. Between them are cells of the splanchnopleuric mesoderm. These cells, lying posterior to the pericardial cavity, will differentiate to form a layer known as myoepicardial mantle. The mantle zone will secrete a gelatinous connective tissue called cardiac jelly, which separates it from the heart tube. This mantle then surrounds the front and side of the endothelial heart tube. The mantle layer will later replace the cardiac jelly. The endothelial heart tube forms the endocardium of the heart, while the myoepicardial mantle will form both the myocardium and the epicardium. In this section, will consider a very important process in the development of the primary heart tube, and that process is cardiac looping. Cardiac looping is the transformation of the straight embryonic heart tube 
into a helically wound loop. This process is broken into phases. The primitive heart begins to experience rapid growth and increase in length as a result of cell contributions from the secondary heart field. At this point, the caudal ends of the heart tube are embedded in the septum transversum here, while the heart flow tract leads to the aortic sac and aortic arches. So, the two outer ends of the primitive heart are fixed, and the rapid elongation of the heart tube cannot take place in a longitudinal direction, rather, it will form a loop. In this next illustration, we see the loop. In this loop, the cephalic portion of the tube here is seen bending ventrally, caudally, and to the right, while the atrial or inferior end is bending dosocranially and to the left. This bending creates a U-shaped cardiac loop. This looping is tilted towards the right side and therefore is also called destro looping. The bulbous cordis forms the upper limb of the loop and the primitive ventricle forms the lower limb of the U-shaped loop. This U-shaped area of the heart will then invaginate into the pericardial cavity. This loop is therefore called bulboventricular loop. The initial lengthening of the primary heart tube is essential for normal formation of part of the right ventricle and the heart flow tract region, that is the conus cordis and truncus arteriosus and also for the looping process. If this lengthening is inhibited, then a variety of heart flow tract defects can occur, and this can include double outlet right ventricle, called DOV, ventricular septal defects, tetralogy of fallow, and pulmonary atresia and pulmonary stenosis. Details of these defects will be considered in the section on clinical correlates. The cardiac loop starts at day 23 and completes at day 28. A dosal mesentery called dosal mesocardium, which suspends the bulboventricular loop at posterior wall of the pericardial cavity, will break down at its center, forming a communication between the right and the left part of the pericardial cavity. This communication is called the pericardial sinus. The formation of the pericardial sinus will enable the bulboventricular loop to lie free within the cavity. But at this point, the primitive atrium and sinus venosus are still outside the pericardial cavity embedded in the septum transversum. While the cardiac loop is forming, expansion of the tube is also taking place throughout the length of the tube. The primitive atrium and sinus venosus will get freed from the septum transversum. The atrial portion will now be incorporated into the pericardial cavity and occupy a position posterior superior to the ventricle, causing the heart tube to now assume another shape, which is S-shape. Bulbous cordis and primitive ventricle will merge together to form a common chamber, the ventricular chamber or the bulboventricular chamber. The atrial chamber that lies behind the truncus arteriosus will expand. As it does so, part of it come to project forward on either side of the truncus arteriosus as the auricles. These two transverse dilatations of the atrium will bulge on each side of the bulbous cordis and will cause the conus and the truncus 
part of the heart tube, initially on the right side of the pericardial cavity, to now shift to a medial position. As a result, the truncus is found in a depression between the right and left atria, and the conus takes an oblique position between the roof of the primitive left ventricle and anterior medial wall of the atrium. We will now consider the contributions from the two major heart fields, the first and the second heart fields. While the first heart field differentiates and forms the linear heart tube, the second heart field progressively proliferates and adds to the primary heart tube. The first heart field will form the following structures, one, most of the left ventricle, and two, part of the atria, while the second heart field will give rise to atria, right ventricle, and outflow tract, and inflow tract. Before we run off this aspect of the development of the primary heart tube, we are going to consider molecular regulations of these processes. Induction of heart development is initiated by cells in both the endoderm and lateral plate mesoderm. These cells will secrete the bone morphogenetic protein, BMP, which will block the cardiogenic inhibitory activity of WNT proteins, which are secreted by the neural tube. The blocking of the activities of WNT by BMP will activate the NKX cells, which are the master gene for heart development. After the development of the heart tubes, retinoic acid signaling will now play an important role in 1. Establishing anterior posterior polarity, number 2. Formation of the inflow and outflow tract progenitors, and finally, growth of the ventricular wall. This acid is produced by cells of the mesoderm around developing atria and sinus venosus. This is where we will end the first part of this lecture. If you have questions, comments or suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. If you like the video, please press the like button and share it to your friends that will also need this knowledge and together we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. See you in my next video. Thank you.